Hi everyone, let me talk to you today about the income and substitution effects. These two effects are very powerful. They can explain a lot of things that we see around us. For instance, they can explain why in almost every rich country now, people are working much, much, much less compared to the great grandparents who lived 100 years ago. This chart shows you the evolution of GDP per capita and total annual hours worked in three countries of Netherlands, France, and the US. Let's focus on the case of Netherlands. As you can see, income per capita in this country rose from around $1,200 to $22,000 during the course of 20th century, an increase of 22-fold. Now, interestingly, at the same time, total annual hours worked declined from around 3,000 hours per year to 1,500 hours. In other words, total annual hours almost halved in Netherlands. So we gather from this chart that on average, people in Netherlands, France, and the US are now much, much richer and work much less compared to their great-grandparents who lived around 1900. Now, the interesting question is why? Which factor can explain the evolution of these two trends happening at the same time? People becoming richer and at the same time working less. The answer to that is increasing wages. Obviously, we know the relationship between increasing wages and GDP per capita. As wages rose, people become richer. But what's the relationship between increasing wages and total annual hours worked? To understand that, we need to know about the income effect and the substitution effect. So let me explain these two effects with an example. This is Sarah. She is a journalist working for Financial Times. Her wage is $15 per hour, and based on this wage, she works six hours a day. That means that she has an 18 hours of free time. Now, let's assume, for whatever reason, Financial Times decided to increase Sarah's wage from $15 per hour to $25 per hour. Perhaps Sarah has become you know, more and more productive and Financial Times fear that if they don't increase her wages, she might go to a better company. Now, the main question is this. How would Sarah react in relation to this increase in her wages? Would she work more or would she work less? In other words, what would happen to her hours of free time? Now, this increase in wages puts Sarah in an interesting economic dilemma. On the one hand, she starts to think this. She thinks that every hour of my work is now worth more than before. Previously, if I didn't work, I would lose $15 per hour. Now I would lose $25 uh, per hour. So I should work more and substitute free time for work. We call this the substitution effect, this voice in Sarah's mind. But at the same time, Sarah thinks that life is not just about working more and more and earning more money. She says this to herself, I can now afford to have more free time. Why? Because I can work less and still maintain or even improve my current level of earning and consumption. We call this income effect. As people become richer and richer, they become more willing and able to afford more time. Therefore, therefore they decide to work less. Now, the main question is that what would happen to Sarah? Which of these effects become stronger in her head? Whether the income effect will dominate the substitution effect or the other way around. And that depends on Sarah's preference regarding the work-life balance. If, for instance, if she puts a lot of value on having free time, then 
the the income effect would dominate the substitution effect and Sarah would end up working less. In other words, she would increase her hours of free time. However, if Sarah valued work more than free time, then the substitution effect would dominate the income effect and therefore Sarah decided to work more and therefore decrease her hours of free time. Now let's visualize the two concepts of income effect and substitution effect using the example of Sarah. Here the x-axis represents the hours of free time per day for Sarah, which can range from 8 to 24. And the y-axis represents her total level of consumption and earning per day. Now the red line is Sarah's feasibility set, which is determined by her wage. If you remember, initially her wage was $15 per hour. Now, the red line here represents all the possible lifestyle options that Sarah can choose from. For instance, at the one extreme, she can decide not to work at all and uh, have 20 hours of free time, but in return, her total level of consumption and earning would go down to zero. And at the other extreme, she can decide to work a lot of hours per day, only have eight hours of free time, and in return, her total level of consumption would go down to $225 per day. Now, in reality, we know that given the wage rate of $15 per hour, Sarah would actually choose A, which means that she would work for six hours and have 18 hours of free time per day. Now, based on her decision, we can say that her preference or her indifference curve would look like something like this blue curve. Remember that we don't see people's preferences or indifference curves. People's indifference curves are in, inside their head. We can only speculate about their preferences based on the actual decisions that they take. And we know that given this wage rate, Sarah actually decides to have 18 hours of free time. Now let's move on. If you remember, subsequently Financial Times decided to increase Sarah's wage from $15 to $25 an hour. And here this is represented by an, an expansion of Sarah's feasibility set. Now, what would Sarah do? Would she increase her hours of free time or reduce her hours of free time? Would she work more or less? Let's think of a hypothetical scenario. Let's assume that after the wage increase, Sarah would choose D. That means that she would, in effect, work more and reduce her hours of free time. We can immediately tell that, you know, substitution effect must have dominated the income effect for Sarah. Sarah, you know, puts a higher value on work than having free time. But let's visualize each of these now. Let's start with the income effect. With income effect, we should ask a hypothetical question. Here's the tricky bit. Let's assume Sarah had become rich, her income has increased, but her wages have remained the same. For instance, a friend of hers just gave, gave her some money. So her income increased, but her wages remained the same. In other words, she became richer, but the opportunity cost of her time remained the same. Now the question is this, what would Sarah do given this uh, you know, shift of income? We can see that she would decide to go from A to C, which means that she would decide to work less and increase her hours of free time. This is the income effect. Now, after isolating the income effect, whatever remains must be the substitution effect. Now, what does this substitution effect tells us? It tells us that Sarah decided you know, to work more and decrease her hours of free time. Why? Because the opportunity cost of having free time went up for Sarah after her increase in wages. 
So as I said from the very beginning, as you can see, the substitution effect dominated the income effect for Sarah. And overall, she decided to work more after getting a promotion from Financial Times. Now let's go back to our original question. What factor can explain the evolution of GDP per capita and total annual hours worked in these three countries? As we said, it was increasing wages. The rise in wages unleashes two opposing effects. The first one is income effect. As people become richer, they become more willing and able to afford more free time. So therefore, they decide to work less and enjoy more leisure time. But at the same time, with increasing wages, the opportunity cost of having a free time go up for people. Therefore, people get an incentive to work more and reduce their leisure. Now, if we take a step back and look at what happened during the course of 20th century, we can immediately tell that the income effect must have dominated the substitution effect. Why? Because people had decided to work much, much less as their wages have increased. Now, let me use the same tools of feasibility sets and indifference curve to explain the changes happening in Netherlands during the course of 20th century. Now, this is the wage rate, the feasibility set for an average person in the Netherlands at the beginning of 20th century. And as we discussed, during the course of 20th century, we had a massive increase in wages, which is represented by an, an expansion in the feasibility set. Now, based on these wages, you know, at the beginning of 20th century, people were choosing point A in terms of hours of free time and consumption. And gradually during this century, they moved from A to D. And as you can see, their level of consumption increased. And at the same time, they had more leisure. They had more free time per day. Now, let's visualize the two concepts of income effect and substitution effect. For income effect... We imagine the hypothetical scenario, imagining that the people in the Netherlands became rich, but the wages didn't change. And here, the green line captures the income effect. As people in the Netherlands became richer and richer, they decided to work less and enjoy their free time. And whatever remains must be the substitution effect. This effect captures the fact that as wages rose in Netherlands, the opportunity cost of leisure went up, so people decided to work more. But as we discussed, the income effect dominated the substitution effect, and therefore overall, people are now working much, much less compared to their great-grandparents who lived in 1900. Now, in the end, let me leave you with an interesting question. So far, we talked about Netherlands, but if we see this graph, we see an interesting outlier, and that's the US. We see that the wages have been growing and growing since 1960, but the total hours of work have remained almost the same. Why? And to answer that question, you need to go back to the core textbook. Thank you.